Welcome to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, have you ever fallen asleep while being prosecuted like Donald Trump did? That um, that suggests a level of comfort with the process that I don't think I could <laughs> muster. Yeah, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've gotten a little fatigued during jury duty, but mm. I was never the uh, defendant in question. No, um, me either. Yeah. does sound like maybe it'd be boring in the jury selection process. Voir dire, as they say. Voir dire. Be, yeah. Did you see the Curb Your Enthusiasm where Larry David is just striking people in the jury pool? Then? No. <laughs> He's like, uh, number 20, he looks like a Fox News viewer. Get him out of here. Get really? him out of here. Yeah. yeah it's really I got to catch up on yeah, a lot of catch curb, up on that curb, including yeah. this season, by yeah. the way. Uh, speaking of award-winning shows, though, Ben. Uh, we love doing this show. We love our audience. We want more people to find the show and listen to it. One way to help that happen is uh, vote for us to win a Webby Award for Best News in Politics podcast. Voting closes on April 18th, so you don't have a lot of time. But if you go to vote.webbyawards.com, search for Crooked Media, and you can vote for us, and you can vote for some of uh, Crooked Media's fun social shows. So do that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we are in heavy Webby season. We're begging. Uh, it's quite like Oscar season. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we need your vote. Uh, uh, we want your vote. Uh, and I, I, I have a plug, Tommy. I always forget to plug things. What do you got? Um, I'm going to be in D.C. next week. For uh, uh, White House Correspondents? No. Oh, no, that's uh, later. No, for Georgetown Global Dialogues, actually. Oh, um, even, even yeah, yeah, the real yeah, events yeah, yeah. of the year. So the uh, real nerd if prom. you are at Worldo in D.C., and I know you're out there, Worldo's in D.C., uh, at 2 o'clock... On April 22nd, uh, I will be at Georgetown uh, speaking about foreign policy and the U.S. election uh, with a pretty cool panel, so come check me out. Cool. All right. Uh, well, we got a great show today, Ben. We're going to cover this massive Iranian attack on Israel from over the weekend, what it means for the war in Gaza and supplemental funding bills in D.C. for a whole host of things, mm. including Israel and Ukraine. Uh, we're also going to talk about why Ukraine is frustrated by the U.S. response to the attack on Israel, uh, a grim anniversary for Sudan, a violent attack on women in Australia, a State Department spy is sentenced, uh, and then we'll have a little fun at the end. And then you're going to hear my interview with Khaled Al-Gindi. Uh, he is a senior fellow and director of program on Palestine and the Palestinian Israel Affairs at the Middle East Institute. Uh, he's a former advisor to the Palestinian side at the Annapolis Talks. Um, super thoughtful guy. And what we did was talk about, okay, what happens when this war finally ends? And reconstruction begins, and we have to figure out a political path forward for the Palestinians internally and also for a broader Middle East peace process. So, Can't wait to hear that. Important yeah. talk. Smart guy. Such a Smart thoughtful guy, guy. yeah. <clears throat> Good follow on um, X, too. Uh, do you call it X? I refuse to <laughs> yeah, not call yeah, it Twitter. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I've ever done it before. That's it. why I said X. You know, it's just such a lame name. Yeah, it is lame. Why did he choose that? Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's start with this uh, Iranian attack on Israel from over the weekend. According to the Pentagon, Iran fired 100 ballistic missiles, 30 cruise missiles, and 150 explosive drones at Israel on Saturday. 99% of them were intercepted, uh, and miraculously, no one was killed, though a seven-year-old girl was seriously wounded. A lot of the missiles and drones were shot down by Israeli missile defense systems like the Iron Dome, David's Sling, and the Arrow 3 system, which, Ben, you probably remember, received billions of dollars of funding from uh, the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. So for all the attacks you hear about Obama abandoning Israel, in fact, uh, those investments saved countless Israeli lives. But in addition to those systems, those missile defense systems, the Pentagon says U.S. fighters shot down 70 drones uh, and U.S. warships and Patriot missile batteries in the region shot down about a half a dozen uh, Iranian missiles. Israel also got support from the U.K., France, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. This attack from Iran was a long-awaited response to Israel's assassination of Several top members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC, in an Iranian diplomatic facility in Syria. Uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, Iran actually briefed several Gulf countries on their attack plan yeah. days in advance, yeah. I guess to deconflict their airspace, but notable. Uh, but that also gave Israel a lot of time to prepare to the point where President Biden was able to fly back from Delaware to the White House to be in the Situation Room for this all to go down. So. Since the attack, uh, Biden has talked with Netanyahu. He did a call with the G7 leaders. He called the King of Jordan. He called the squadron leaders that helped shoot down all these drones. We're now all waiting to see if Israel responds. Uh, Israel's defense minister told Lloyd Austin, the secretary of defense, that Israel has no choice but to respond, according to news reports. Netanyahu has reportedly requested uh, a bunch of response options from the IDF. So, Ben, um, the fact that these like Sunni Arab countries like Saudi Arabia and Jordan were part of a coalition defending Israel 
is fascinating to me. I know they hate Iran and have for a long time, but still it's shocking that they defended Israel to the point where, you know, these missiles were landing on Jordanian soil and potentially wounding Jordanians. But also we've seen that Biden's message to Bibi Netanyahu is basically take the win, don't escalate. Um, It's not clear if he's going to follow that advice, but certainly they can kind of turn the dial up or down if they want. I suspect a cyber attack or a response on Iranian proxies in Syria, for example, might have a less inflammatory feel to it, whereas a direct strike on Iran could cause things to explode. But what are you looking for? And what did you make of that initial volley on Saturday night? I mean, I know we were texting back and forth, yeah. like pretty pretty scary five hours to sit around and wait for those things to get into Israeli airspace. Yeah, I mean, it's a new, you know, a lot of new things have happened since October 7th. And this is definitely, you know, a new dynamic where Iran is signaling they're willing to attack Israel from Iranian soil. We talked about the fact that Israel attacked the Iranian embassy compound in Damascus, sovereign Iranian territory. So that's the logic that the Iranians used to justify this attack um, as a reciprocal attack. Um, it's interesting to me, like if, if Iran truly wanted to escalate into like a war with Israel, they did the opposite of that. You know, um, they didn't use the thousands of rockets that they've provided to Hezbollah over the years that are very close to Israel and would, uh, I mm-hmm. think, be able to evade at least some of the air defense systems. They announced <laughs> that they were doing this, briefed it. Um, and honestly, if you're trying to like, you know, w- whether it's because of deliberate not wanting to escalate further or whether they're incompetent, whatever the reason is, Flying drones for several hours over other countries in the direction of a country that you know has incredibly sophisticated air defense systems is, is kind of a strange way of going about uh, trying to actually land yeah. uh, a punch. Although they did, but the, the but ballistic missiles and the that's cruise the thing. missiles were I, the ballistic additive. missiles and the cruise missiles. Um, you know, I think are intended to kind of send a message. Look at this capability we have, and actually, I think part of what we learned is just how good the air defense systems are, that you know, even Iran having these ballistic missiles is not any guarantee that they can, uh, again, land that, um, I almost say land a punch, but I hate to like trivialize what is a very serious situation. So all that's to say is that Iran was clearly trying to calibrate in the kind of weird signaling of the Middle East where, mm-hmm. well, we have to respond, but we we don't want to escalate it further. They put a, I had a statement out like uh, that you pointed my attention to right away, Tommy, from the Iranian representative at the UN that, Immediately, it's like, okay, we're done. This we're is good. over. Yeah, we're good. We're cool. You know, like, we're cool. We're cool. You know, like, yeah. and, and so the whole thing was kind of strange in that it was a huge escalation. It was, you know, obviously an outrageous thing for them to do. Um, very dangerous for uh, the Israeli people. Very thankful that uh, they were able to shoot down so much of this. And also, like, very calibrated by Iran to try to contain its own escalation, you know. Um, so what happens now? Well, you know, in the kind of strange back and forth, you know, the balls in Israel's court. Um, and, and I think it worth saying, like, you don't need to swing at every pitch here. Uh, no. y- you know, like the, there's if they the options available to them, the escalatory option would be to launch an attack at Iranian soil. You know, so if they choose to bomb Iranian military facilities or certainly Iranian nuclear facilities, anything in Iran, then I think Iran in the kind of crazy logic of the Middle East would feel like then they need to respond in a bigger way than they did last time. And yeah. and that's how you keep the escalation going. There are other options available. One is, you know, not, you know, bombing something. I mean, again, like my, 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 my kids learn in kindergarten, like you don't always have to hit back. You, you know? can talk. Um, you can talk. Um, Diplomacy might work. But even like other pathways are available. You mentioned like a cyber option, something yeah. inside of Iran that's not that visible, but also like hitting these Iranian proxy forces. And I don't want to diminish that. Um, But, you know, we've seen Israel take strikes against Iranian proxies in Lebanon and Syria and Iraq. Um, So there are different ways. There's also Iranian naval assets. um, Or sanctions. There's all kinds of things they can do. And what the U.S. clearly does not want is Israel to hit Iran directly and then Iran sitting back. And this war could escalate to Lebanon, Iraq, across the region. The U.S. could get pulled in. Iran could shut down, you know, the Straits of Hormuz through which massive amounts of the global economy pass. Um, and all of a sudden there's huge global economic shocks, oil prices through the roof, risks to U.S. service numbers. That's what we don't want to have happen. Yeah. I mean, look, when when Trump ordered the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, then the head of the IRGC, the Iranians responded by firing over a dozen ballistic missiles at U.S. forces at bases in the region. Uh, it, 
miraculously, no one was killed, but 100 U.S. service members got traumatic brain injuries. But Trump, to his credit, left it there. Like the yeah. in that case too, the Iranians sent a message saying like, "Okay, this is it for us. We're done." They're like that weird kind of little guy in the schoolyard that runs up to the big bully and <laughs> yeah. punches him in the yeah. face. It's like, "Okay, it's over." Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. it was effective at the time. Ben, but you know, stepping back, like I am, I'm really glad the U.S. did all this took all these steps to protect Israeli civilians and that no one was killed in these strikes. It was very frustrating to me, though, to immediately watch the conversation about the Iranian attack in Washington just completely omit the fact that this was the Iranians responding to Israel bombing the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Like, part of the conversation should be, don't do that. You yeah. know what I mean? And, like, everyone in D.C. is always talking about deterrence and what it entails, but they never pause to think, I wonder if starting wars is maybe not the best way to prevent them yeah. you know yeah. unless you think i'm kind of exaggerating or doing a straw man of a republican listen to this cut of uh trump's former national security advisor john bolton senator tom cotton and congressman rich mccormick from georgia from various tv shows the way to reestablish deterrence is not proportional that's academic talk the way you establish deterrence is by telling your adversary if you ever try that again the price you will pay will be so much higher than any gain you think you can get, you shouldn't even think about it. I think Israel should be looking at this as an opportunity to destroy Iran's nuclear weapons program, which is the existential threat that Israel faces. President Biden is wrong telling Israel that they should respond. Imagine America getting 300 drones and missiles shot at our homeland and having a country telling us not to respond. Now, it's up to Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet, and ultimately the elected government and people of Israel about how and when they respond. It's hard to imagine this doesn't steal their resolve to finish the job against Hamas and Gaza. There's no commensurate response except for power. The only way to end a war is end it quickly. If you draw this out, it's going to have bad results. We should take out their cap capability to produce drones, which take out their capability of producing the income, and we'd undercut the entire terror process around the world, whether it be the Houthis, the Hamas, Hezbollah, or Iran itself. Who's that good old boy at the end? Of Rich McCormick. <laughs> I never heard of him either. Yeah, but apparently, yeah, all of them didn't yeah. open a newspaper through the duration of the war on terror. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah they didn't learn yeah, any yeah, lessons. Yeah. I, I, I mean, we should spend just a minute on this because it's totally crazy. And yeah, John Bolton, you know, like principal architect or one of the architects of the Iraq War. Um, really good track record. And actually a bit of a tell that he's like, this is an opportunity for, yeah. like he literally sees getting attacked as an opportunity. Yes. Or now we get to bomb more things, you know? And these are these are not inevitable choices. Again, to wind back the tape, like there are consequences to pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. There are consequences to assassinating Qasem Soleimani. There are consequences to bombing an Iranian diplomatic facility. None of that means that Iran are good guys or right. that, that we're sympathizing with the Iranians. What we're saying is, the logic of uh, like picking fights with people and tearing up diplomatic agreements is you end up in wars with them. You don't always you get know? to be the victim either. Yeah, yeah the story well, doesn't start where you want it to start. <laughs> the thing about Washington is so crazy is that the story, literally for this whole thing, started with the Iranian attack. We've been saying since October seventh that that there's this risk of escalation. There's this increased tension across the region. The Middle East is going to be a tinderbox so long as this war is going on. Israel's policy in Gaza that a lot of people in Washington were upset about like a week ago, and now nobody's talking about it. Which, by the way is one of the outcomes that maybe Bibi Netanyahu is okay with, we'll right? Get that, uh, we'll yeah. get to that. And, 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 and so this is an insane way of thinking. And again, I think part of what's strange to me, Tommy, to bring politics into this a little bit, is some of this is they are, John Bolton, he believes this. Like, you know, he's a true believer in that the next war is going to be the one that turns out well, you know? Yeah, and the architect of the, and the architect of the maximum pressure strategy on Iran that was supposed to prevent they all of this. failed. All these goons that we just heard from, like, criticized the Iran nuclear deal, which was working in terms of constraining the Iran nuclear program, and then we've tried their maximum pressure thing for years, and it, it ends with Iran firing missiles at Israel. And they're closer and, to getting a nuke than it, they were it, ever before. It, it, if, if Iran had fired missiles at, at, at Israel during the Iran nuclear deal, they would have you know, gone ballistic. Their policy failed, right? This is where their policy leads to war. And the politics of this thing is some of this is like the reflexive, like, well, if I look tough on Iran, that's got good politics. Shouldn't they did did they not learn anything from Trump, who has actually been pretty good at triangulating off of this wing of the Republican Party and saying, like, I don't want to get into wars, you know? Yeah. And again, I don't think that Trump's policies actually reflect that because some of the things he did contributed to the situation. But I, I, I if I'm Biden, 
I wouldn't be afraid of this stuff. I wouldn't either. Because Americans don't want to go to war with Iran. They don't want to be in a war with Iran. That is very clear. Donald Trump understands that, right? Yeah. Which is why he didn't respond to that ballistic missile attack. And also globally, like you're hearing voices like the comments like Tom Cotton and John Bolton in Israel, in their far right. You're also hearing them in the far right in the U.S. But internationally, like uh, Rishi Sunak said to, to Parliament, the prime minister of the U.K., we would urge them to take cost, take the win at this point. So he's echoing the Biden. It's a good line, you know. It's Israel. like yeah, because yeah. in the exchange, right? They blew up an embassy and killed a bunch of RGC people, and the Iranians fired a bunch of and stuff, and it all got shot down. So you know what? Yeah. That that's fine. Like just back off. Yeah, Macron, president of France, saying uh, we will do everything to avoid a conflagration. That is to say, an escalation. The German foreign minister, Anna Bayerbach. The, the right to self-defense means fending off an attack, she said. Retaliation is not a category in international law. So the entire world is saying, take yeah. the win, cool your jets. But you got these right-wing zealots in the U.S. and Israel demanding more, more, more. One I don't, you know, and you heard out of Israel, even from, you know, um, not just from Netanyahu or even the far-right people, but from, I think, uh, Benny Gantz, like, well, we have to respond. I, why? Like, I don't know why war... Like more war is the answer to to any yeah, question man. in foreign policy. Like it's like Israel has deterrence. They have nuclear weapons. You know, um, they have missile defenses. They, they so you don't have to like pick a war to to show that you'll be able to fight back. I mean, it's just not, the logic is out of out, out of joint here. I also wonder if they, you know this is like the the cat's out of the bag in terms of Israeli politics because you know they've been so hawkish in their in their rhetoric about Iran for years the Israelis wake up and read in the newspaper about you know covert efforts to kill Iranian scientists yeah. and to take out their computer systems and centrifuges and things so now it's like you're hearing a lot of Israeli voices on the street you know blame who blame Iran for what Hamas did on October 7th and they're demanding retribution and vengeance in a lot of ways and part of that is like an understandable feeling but it doesn't make it a smart policy yeah yeah like you don't have to act on every feeling no you, know? you do not but as you mentioned I mean the war in Gaza is still raging uh, more aid may be getting into Gaza but it's still insufficient and Israeli protesters are still regularly blocking aid trucks from getting into Gaza for hours and hours at a time we reached out to Melanie Ward the CEO of an organization called Medical Aid for Palestinians, about her recent trip to Gaza. She was just there. Uh, here is some of what she said about the aid process and what's getting in. When I was on the way, um, actually on the way back from Gaza, I saw some of the items that have been rejected by Israeli, quote, security, some of the humanitarian items. Um, this included a whole lot, lot of different kinds of medical equipment, such as an anesthesia machine, an x-ray machine, it included first aid kits, bleach, it included a box of wooden crutches, a wheelchair, it included solar lamps and generators, which you need when there's no electricity and when people are displaced and, you know, taking shelter under pieces of plastic on the ground. Um, you need these things when uh, everything is in such a desperate state. Um, I also saw their sleeping bags, which had been rejected. They were rejected apparently because they were green and green is supposedly a military color. So I don't know what kind of system stops displaced people from having access to a sleeping bag because it's the wrong color, but it's horrifying. And this is where we are. And for all the talk, the situation on the ground remains disastrous. Melanie also told us, I mean, she is someone who reads the news about what's happening in Gaza all day, every day. She's in touch with her staff on the ground all day, every day. She knows all the statistics, has read all the stories, but nothing, she said, can prepare you for actually seeing what it's like on the ground. The humanitarian situation is intolerable. Yeah, and there's just no justification. I mean, Israel, pre-October 7th, in, in their blockade of Gaza for, you know, I don't know, 15 plus years now, um, they claim that they restrict stuff from getting in that has dual use technology, or dual use purposes. It could be used for military purpose. What there is no military purpose for a sleeping bag or no. some crutches or uh, anesthesia. Like, just think of how how sick it is to not allow anesthetic to get in. Like, just so what people can feel more pain, um, or to not allow crutches in. I mean, what what is the logic? What is the mindset? Of whoever is making that decision, because it's it's fucked up, you yeah, know. Deeply. And 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 as David Miliband said to us, this is an international legal requirement. It's not a favor yeah. to let medical equipment in. It is 
a legal obligation under international law to allow that kind of assistance to get in. And 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 despite you know the promises that came out of that phone call with Netanyahu and Biden, clearly there's still these problems. Arwa Damon, who's a great reporter uh, for CNN, wrote a first person account of her recent visit to Gaza, and she talked about interviewing a doctor who told her a story about I think it was a ten year old boy who died on the operating table having his leg amputated without anesthesia. You know, it was just it was such horrific pain that he just died. And there's just and we've talked about this, Tommy, but international journalists have not gotten in. There are Palestinian journalists who've done a lot to bring this to people's Heroic attention work, yeah. um, through social media or any a platform they can find. Yeah. A lot have died. I, I just think it's probably, again, worse than anybody can imagine once people get in there. Um, like we said, the body count's probably worse because people are under the rubble. And I think that the backdrop of this Iran exchange is th- there's no end in sight to the war in Gaza. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. I think we all, there's kind of been this assumption at some point there'll be a ceasefire, there'll be a deal for hostages. Well, the the, the combination of, you know, um, Hamas has been intransigent, um, Israel, you know, killed the children and grandchildren of one of the Hamas leaders are negotiating with. So that guy's probably not like a little more inclined. Might be to a little more deal. dug in now, yeah. Um, the Iranians attacking uh, in this back and forth probably hardens attitudes in Israel generally um, because there's uh, they obviously draw a linkage between, um, you know, uh, Hamas and uh, Iran as uh, a financer of Hamas. Um, they remain committed to this Roth operation. And so I think we have to adjust our thinking to the reality that it's possible that this war goes through the summer, you yeah. know, that there's not necessarily like some, you know, we're not on the precipice of a ceasefire. And, and on top of that, I mean, there's reports today that Israel assassinated a, a senior Hezbollah commander in a strike in southern Lebanon, and then Hezbollah is firing rockets in response. So again, like the the lid could pop off that. There's violent clashes in the West Bank that are steadily increasing. Uh, dozens of Israelis and Palestinians were hurt over the weekend in fighting after a missing 14-year-old Israeli boy was found dead. Uh, an Israeli settler shot and killed two Palestinians in the West Bank on Monday alone. The point is, the, the war's not over. It's not getting better. Every day, the risk of escalation increases. But to your point, I mean, this Iran strike or attack on Israel seems to have stalled any momentum behind conditioning U.S. aid or using U.S. leverage to help end the war. Instead, we have Congress rushing more military funding to Israel. So Speaker Johnson wants to call votes on a whole bunch of new supplemental funding bills. Uh, according to a document obtained by PBS NewsHour, he wants a vote on one bill that provides uh, $48 billion for Ukraine, another to provide $14 billion for Israel with no conditioning on that assistance, $2.4 billion for Red Sea operations, which I assume is like counter Houthi strike yeah, stuff. Yeah, and probably just the, the additional cost of having the U.S. military more right. postured in that Carriers region. there yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's another bill or two maybe for like $6 billion for Indo-Pacific stuff. There's some Taiwan money in there yeah, too. Somewhere. Yeah. Democrats <laughs> yeah. want a vote on sending uh, at least $9 billion in humanitarian aid to Gaza. So that obviously we'd support that. There might be a vote on a ban for, on TikTok. So it's very confusing. Um, <laughs> It's also not it's clear. Like real Frankenstein. Here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and not clear Speaker Johnson is going to survive to get to a vote, speaking of Frankenstein, because he has yeah. right-wingers like Marjorie Taylor Greene. He has Tom Massey both threatening to oust him through the motion to vacate process. So, Ben, I mean, I guess stepping back, like, how worried are you that Gaza could become an afterthought in Washington in particular as everyone focuses on Iran? And, like, again, am I a paranoid freak to wonder if part of Netanyahu's plan all along was to take that strike in Damascus, take out some IRGC generals, I, and I, see if he could make this an Iran-Israel fight. I gotta say that thought has been front of my mind uh, for a few weeks now. You know, because he had to know if you bomb a Iranian embassy that they're gonna do something in response. I, I mean, you know, he may not have known that they launch you know hundreds of drones and missiles at Israel, but um, he'd much rather the focus be on Iran in Washington, you know, than on Israel's operation in Gaza. And, and again, it really is absurd to me that, you know, when Jose Andreas is mad at, at people in Washington, they suddenly want to condition aid. And then a, a week later, it's like that's just memory hold, you know. And, and, and the reality is, even if you're taking the position that, well, we don't want to uh, with, withdraw a, military assistance to Israel uh, in the wake of this attack. One of the things that's been on the table for a long time is suspending the delivery of offensive weapons. Right. right. So you could maybe keep providing Iron Dome support, missile defense support, purely defensive weapons. But you don't need to give Israel a 2,000-pound bomb to defend itself against Iran. Like, that's 
being that's assistance to be used in an offensive military operation in Gaza, the kind of thing that is causing all these civilian casualties. So there's just no logic to to this shift other than the the, the political conversation changed to Iran. It, it also like says something pretty weird about the United States as a country, and again, this is on the Republicans, not not this part is not on Joe Biden, that like, well, we'll sit for months on our hands in terms of providing support to a country, Ukraine defending itself, you know, but, you know, we'll, we'll rush this assistance out the door to Israel as they're carrying out this kind of Iran. open-ended thing uh, in Gaza. Like it just, I don't know, not, nobody comes out as looking great. You know? No, I want to get to Ukraine in one second, but but one last thing on, on Israel. Um, and we haven't talked about him much on the show because he's mostly just an anti-vaccine crank. But if you guys have liberal or leftist friends who are into a Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s campaign for some reason, just make sure they search his views on Gaza because he is far more hawkish than Joe Biden. He These are some quotes. So Robert F. RFK Jr. said that Israel, quote, does not have any choice except to eradicate Hamas. He denied that there was a siege on the civilian population in Gaza, even after the Israeli government announced it. Yeah. Uh, he said, quote, the Palestinian people are arguably the most pampered people by international aid organizations in the history of the world. That's a direct quote. I transcribed it myself. Uh, he opposes even a temporary ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, in 2023, he said he opposed Biden getting back into the Iran nuclear agreement, and he regurgitated all the Trump lines about like pallet to cash type stuff even though he supported the deal back in 2015. So this guy is just like a political hack who is apparently super hawkish on foreign policy and willing to call the Palestinian people who have been in a dire humanitarian situation for 15 years now pampered. Yeah, I mean, the 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 core point you make is that, like, we're going to have a conversation, I'm sure, for the next few months about people who are, like, maybe uh, dissatisfied, angry, uh, about Biden's Gaza policy and, and therefore want to vote for somebody else. I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons why. I mean, anybody who listens to this podcast knows that you and I have had a lot of problems with the Biden policy, but I frankly think that uh, that's a bad idea. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just, just um, educate yourself on the other options. Just to look at the other, because you ha- an election is about choices, right? And, and this guy is not like a different option. I will say, interestingly, um, I, I wonder how much his views on this are, uh, and it doesn't justify the view, but, you know, a Palestinian assassinated uh, his father, right? Mm. So th- 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 I'm just, I don't know anything. I don't, That's a very good point. I don't know what goes on in RFK Jr.'s head. <laughs> you know? Lucky you. Um, yeah, you yeah, 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 I don't want to know. Um, because what's weird is he's the only common thread, because I've heard him give interviews about foreign policy, and the only common thread is kind of con- it's same thing. It's like conspiracy theories. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's like, so far left, you can't see it. Sometimes it's far right, you can't see it. Like he's, this is not the guy you want to launch your, you know, <clears throat> no. vote to. Uh, no. So let's get to your Ukraine point because the the fact that uh, the U.S. and other Western allies directly intervened to intercept these attacks on Israel, but not they did not do that for Ukraine, has not been lost on President Zelensky. Uh, he tweeted a long message that said, in part, and these are quotes. The entire world witnessed allied action in the skies above Israel and neighboring countries. It demonstrated how truly effective unity in defending against terror can be when it is based on sufficient political will. Israel is not a NATO member, so no action such as triggering Article 5 was required. European skies could have received the same level of protection long ago if Ukraine had received similar full support from its partners in intercepting drones and missiles. Terror must be defeated completely and everywhere, not more in some places and less in others, was part of a long statement he put out. Um, So, Ben, uh, Ukraine's permanent representative to the UN said that Russia has fired a thousand missiles, 2,800 drones, and 7,000 guided aerial bombs at Ukraine since the start of the war. According to a report in Politico, Ukraine's success rate in shooting down Russian missiles and drones has gone from 90% to 46% more recently. They're just like running out of interceptors. Uh, The Washington Post reported that back in February, Vice President Kamala Harris told Zelensky to stop attacking Russian oil infrastructure because the Biden administration was worried it would jack up global energy prices. Mm. Uh, The Post said that message did not go over well. And Ukraine instead doubled down on those attacks. Uh, So, Ben, like Zelensky's anger here, 
Totally understandable. Totally understandable. Uh, it's also a fact that Russia has nukes that can hit the U.S., so yeah. the context is different. Iran does not, uh, which, by the way, is why the JCPO is, JCPOA was a, a good idea <laughs> to idea. prevent Iran yeah. from getting a nuclear weapon. But what do you make of the argument from Zelensky here, and, and do you think it's likely to prod countries to do more to support him, or are you hearing anything out of Washington that gives you hope that supplemental funding bill for Ukraine might pass? I think that, you know, I, I, I am entirely sympathetic to Zelensky here, I don't think that the U.S. like, and we talked all way back when about things like a U.S. enforced no-fly zone. The U.S. getting involved in a direct military confrontation with Russia, even in a defensive manner, is just you know that's a huge risk. It's you intolerable know, escalation. Job risk, one, job one for foreign policy is to not have World War Three happen. You know, and. And and so I understand the U.S. reticence there, but big but here, where I agree with Zelensky, why are we not providing far more air defense systems to the Ukrainians? Um, that it should stands to reason that if it, like that's the kind of thing we should be dramatically ramping up uh, in terms of our provision to the Ukrainians. I'm sure that you know some of that is in the SUP. Yeah. So it's that, again, that's not it's necessarily even yeah. a critique of Biden. That's a critique of Republicans holding this up. Why would you not want to give these people? Patriots and air defense systems and and whatever they need to shoot down drones. Like we should be giving them all of that stuff. Because even if you're someone who's like, ah, I'm a little uncomfortable, kind of perpetuating the war on the front line that's just getting people killed. That, that and it, that's an ar- a good argument. You know, you can make an argument both ways on that because you can also say you have to fortify Ukraine, give them enough weapons so that they can be in a negotiation with Russia in a stronger position. Even if that's your view, though, you should want to give them these defensive systems. Um, and, and so that's a no brainer. And I do think there's something there's an interesting frustration I've seen in Zelensky's messaging recently where he's willing to criti- criticize the U.S. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's always been a bit, but I totally get it. Like, oh, I, Joe Biden, I get you don't want oil prices a little higher in your election year. Really? <laughs> we want to survive. You know, yeah, that's, tough. Um, that's tough. And similarly, he's been willing to go after Republicans more which takes a lot of guts because Trump is the guy holding up the supplemental. And so Zelensky seems like he doesn't have a problem um, necessarily going there and you know, calling out Republican intransigence, even though that Republican intransigence is being you know, mainly driven by someone who could be president. Yeah, it's, got, it's a really tough political situation to be in for him. And, and by the way, um, Foreign Affairs magazine, it might have run today or this week, this really interesting piece about why and how the early peace talks between Ukraine and Russia broke down. Um, the talks happened, these were the the first weeks and months yeah. of the war. There were a lot of parties involved. There's a lot of different opinions on, on what happened and what broke down. But the gist seems to be that while various versions of a draft agreement between the parties guaranteed that Ukraine wouldn't join NATO or have nuclear weapons, There was some language in there requiring the countries that were supposed to be the guarantors of this agreement to directly intervene if there was some sort of invasion. So the U.S. would have to come to Ukraine's defense if Russia invaded, uh, which I don't think most Western countries were ready to agree to. Um, There was also the fact that the talks were as the talks were ongoing. The Russians withdrew from the the northern vector of invasion, right? They withdrew from their attempt to invade from Belarus. That exposed all the war crimes that had happened in places like Bucha. It hardened yeah. opinion in Ukraine. And I think everybody just didn't trust Putin at that point because obviously he had been saying, no, 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 I'm not going to invade Ukraine. And then he did. But again, this is another area where you sort of alluded to this. Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is a, either a liar or living on a different planet. Oh, in this one, he's totally crazy. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. As recently as March, he yeah. said Putin was about was withdrawing his troops when Biden sent Boris Johnson over to tear up this proposed peace agreement <laughs> because Biden's real goal was to expand NATO into Ukraine. Like that is just nuts. And the opposite of that reporting, right? Because the, the U.S. was reticent to give that security guarantee. Right. You know, I think that it'll be very interesting to kind of learn the whole history of what happened in those early weeks and whether there truly was an opportunity to reach some kind of deal or whether it was just there were some talks and some formulations being yeah. passed back and forth. We don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's suffice to say it wasn't, you know, Boris Johnson killing <laughs> killing peace uh, deals on behalf of... I mean, there was... Biden emissary Boris Johnson. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I okay. mean, the, the, yeah, that, that, that didn't happen. I mean, I do think, like, we should, you know... I, I did What A Day, a uh, great podcast to, you know, uh, people on a daily dose of crooked. Right. Um, and I got a great question, which was like, you know, hey, seems like World War Three is uncomfortably close here, you know? 
And I, we need to take this seriously, right? You've got, you got an actual war in, in Ukraine. You've got a, a war in the Middle East. And that could escalate substantially. You've got you know, China could have Taiwan contingencies. We do need some diplomacy here, you know, and the one lesson I would take is that even in the hardest possible circumstances, like the early weeks, and I'm not suggesting, I don't know, I'm not suggesting the Biden team could have like pulled some diplomatic rabbit out of a hat. I'm just saying like going, for, like, let's say something flares up in Taiwan. Like, I hope mm -hmm. it's not like a momentum towards conflict. It's like, how do we get the hell out of this becoming a war? You know, like we need to start being really aggressive precisely because we are uncomfortably close to World War III. Um, now is the time to really be dialing up uh, the diplomacy here. Yeah, both sides think that the only way to uh, restore deterrence is one last attack. Yeah. It's not a great place to Yeah, be. everybody thinks they're going to have the last attack that restores deterrence. Yeah. And, and then we're sometimes good. the deterrence is just not having the war in the first place. Yeah, so like, that'd be nice. Uh, okay, Ben, let's turn to Sudan because uh, Monday, April 15th, marked a grim anniversary in Sudan. It's the one-year anniversary of the Civil War. And with so much focus on Gaza and Ukraine, uh, it is important to remember that one of the worst conflicts in the world is only getting worse. So some quick stats from the last year, according to the United Nations humanitarian agencies, more than 8 million people have fled their homes. At least 14,000 people have ki been killed in Sudan. I I'm sure that number is much higher because there's so little information getting in and out. Uh, 25 million people, roughly half the population of Sudan, require humanitarian assistance. And Save the Children warns that 230,000 more children, pregnant women, and new mothers could die in the coming months due to hunger. So this civil war broke out a year ago uh, when two generals who were once allied began this bitter power struggle. That power struggle has evolved into a broader proxy war. So you have Sudan's military, which is commanded by General Abdel Fattah al-Burnam. He is backed by Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, Ukraine, and Iran. And then you have the paramilitary group, the Rapid Support Forces, or RSF. It's led by a general most commonly known as Hameti. He gets support and weapons from the UAE and from the Wagner Mercenary Group in Russia, our old buddies. Um, on Monday, 58 countries at this conference in Paris pledged $2.1 billion in humanitarian aid to Sudan. That is just nowhere near enough. Uh, and as French President Emmanuel Macron noted, the humanitarian relief money raised by this conference is probably less than what's been spent by the various powers fighting the proxy war in Sudan already, so combined. We spoke with uh, Jada Doyen McKenna, the CEO of Mercy Corps, an organization that has been providing support in Sudan since 2004. Here's a clip of uh, what she makes of this donor conference and its successes. After yesterday's international pledging conference, we are still facing a shortfall of approximately $2 billion to respond to the urgent needs of the Sudanese people and to provide life-sustaining essentials like food and shelter. The $2.1 billion that has been pledged represents just 20 cents per day for each person in dire need of assistance. It is extremely concerning and quite frankly, a moral outrage that despite famine warnings, world leaders have pledged barely half of the funds needed to save lives. So the, the crisis in Sudan is also destabilizing neighboring countries like Chad, South Sudan, and Egypt, which have to manage these unsustainable refugee flows and build these huge camps for people. Uh, so, you know, first of all, shout out to Mercy Corps and these organizations for the life-saving work they're doing. But Ben, I mean, a couple weeks back, we talked about Sudan and I reached out to a buddy who was one of the leaders of the Saved R4 movement back in the early 2000s, just to say, like, is there anything similar happening? Is anyone standing up a similar organization uh, to try to do something outside of government? And his answer was basically no. And while Saved R4 obviously didn't prevent the genocide from happening in Darfur, it at least was this global movement to raise awareness and force governments to respond and to take some sort of action. And now that's just, that doesn't even exist. And it's just, you know, it left me wondering, like, what happened? How did this just completely fall apart? Yeah, I think it's because um, the breakdown, I mean, part of it's just like the world is crazier and there's more stuff going on and things that would normally get, at, you know, normally would have gotten attention in the 90s or early aughts, you know, or, or just getting drowned out. But another big piece of this is the degree to which the international order has collapsed. It, it doesn't really exist anymore. You know, the you mentioned the, the nations providing support on both sides of this. Like the whole world is like a, you know, series of proxy wars taking place. And, you know, back in the day, you know, even in the Obama years, like we dealt with Sudan, South Sudan through the UN Security Council. Like 
that's a joke now. Like you can't you right. know, get anything done Nothing through happens. the UN Security Council because Russia and China and the U.S. don't agree on anything. And so then it becomes this kind of, you know, everybody backing their warlord. And and again, I I don't think you have. No, I don't think I know you don't have a civil war like this in Sudan absent these external powers like arming different sides. Oh no you doubt, know? yeah. And so that's the problem. The the problem is sure some of it's in Sudan, but if you if you could adjust the wiring of of these countries providing a support you could you could have a shot at ending this thing pretty quickly you know um so that's the first point um and this is where you think we'd have some leverage like yeah. to call the uae and say stop sending weapons to the rsf well that's yeah that's, that's a paramilitary yeah. force uh, and that's the that where the u.s could focus more attention and there's a very good uh, envoy in tom periello now trying to do this but and to the point about the uae like Guess who has two billion dollars? You know, like yeah. like if the UAE was spending that money trying to avert a famine, and ultimately it's in their interest because I don't think it, it it helps to have this degree of of mass suffering and disorder across all of North Africa like we're no. seeing. That that begets other problems. It begets insurgencies, terrorism, obviously above all uh, famine and and humanitarian suffering. Um, and, and again, the you know the we just talked about the U.S. you know trying to shovel you know. $14 billion out the door in Israeli assistance. And I, I guarantee you couldn't squeeze probably a few hundred million dollars out the door for USAID for Sudan. I mean, it, we need to, uh, different priorities, frankly. The world needs different priorities. America needs different priorities. And and again, that's, you know, that's more about Congress than the Biden administration. That's just, you know, what what, what you can get. Yeah. It's amazing what uh, how quickly Congress will move to buy more weapons. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, uh, very depressing. Yeah. Uh, okay, speaking of depressing stories, so sad one out of Australia, Ben. We're on Saturday uh, in Bondi Junction in Sydney. One of the country's deadliest mass killings in decades took place when a man with a knife entered a shopping mall and stabbed 18 people, leaving six dead. All but two of the victims were women, including a nine-month-old baby girl. So this 40-year-old attacker reportedly had a long history of mental illness. Uh, Police Commissioner Karen Webb was asked at a press conference if the attacker singled out women, to which she replied, quote, I think everyone seeing that footage can see that for themselves. So this guy was just targeting women. Uh, one male, The one male victim who died was a security guard. He was working his first shift at the mall, and he lost his life while trying to intervene and save people. Uh, 24 hours before this attack, hundreds of people gathered for a rally just outside Melbourne, calling for action on violence against women after months of high-profile murders involving female victims. One activist who spoke at the rally provided some statistics regarding violence against women in Australia. Uh, they were as follows. One in two women have experienced sexual harassment. One in three women have experienced violence since the age of 15. One in four Australian women have experienced intimate partner violence since 15. One in five women in Australia have experienced sexual violence since the age of 15. So the, the father of the mall attacker contacted police when he heard the news uh, and he had this to say to the media. I'm extremely sorry. I'm heartbroken for you. I, look, this is so horrendous that I can't even explain it. You, you're trying to give me, to give you an intelligent conversation. I can't do it because I'm just devastated. I love yeah. my son. I made myself a servant to my son when I found out he had a mental illness. Mm. I became his servant. I did everything because I love that boy. This is a parent's absolute nightmare when they have a child with mental illness, that something like this would happen. And my heart goes out to the people our son has hurt. Just devastating. Um, so the attack finally ended when a female police officer named Amy Scott shot the attacker dead. Uh, so look, we just want to raise it, send some some love to our listeners and friends in Australia uh, because it's scary stuff. And also just, it's pretty dark, man, that like one of my initial thoughts when I heard this story was, Thank God this didn't happen in America because that guy would have had a gun. Yeah, yeah. And it would have yeah. been even worse. I'm not yeah. I'm not saying like you know what I mean? I'm just like glad Australia has actual gun laws that prevented this guy seemingly from getting one. Well, yeah, they have actually really strong gun laws and, and that, that has really driven down gun violence. I mean, I I mentioned you, Tommy, like I heard some from some listeners in Australia about this violence against women piece of it. And um I did a similar dive into the kind of statistics which are really jarring. And even if this guy has mental illness, and you know, I don't, you can't get in someone's head uh, in any case. Uh, but if you're in a society that is kind of too tolerant of this of violence against women, you know, it does kind of open the door to people taking that to extremes. You know, and oh, yeah. and I think it raises the bar on societies like in Australia to to really take a concerted across the board effort to try to get at the root causes of violence against women, which we've seen, by the way, in too many places. Like, 
we, you just talked about Australia. India's had all these problems mm -hmm. uh, over the years where you've seen periodic uprisings, essentially, people being like, what, you know, they're, they're awful sexual assaults that sometimes happen in public. The UK, there have been issues over the years of, of women feeling like there was a kind of normalization of people being harassed. In the US, obviously. Even we, by police. Yeah, but, UK, yeah, yeah, police in the UK. And obviously the US has had, you know, uh, the Me Too movement and all kinds. So I do think that this is the, the most jarring reminder that, um, you know, that even in I don't know, relatively um, nonviolent, you know, advanced democracies, uh, you can't ignore, you can't allow these kinds of issues to just fester. You yeah, know, I think violence against women is, is a really high indicator that someone might commit homicide. Yeah, you yeah, know, kill exactly. Kill a spouse, kill yeah. a partner. There was also a really scary incident in Australia on Monday where there was a bishop at a church who yeah, was, that was stabbed crazy. That while was giving nuts. a sermon. Yeah. It was live streamed. Yeah. Apparently it was a, they, the cops said it was a terrorist attack by a religious extremist, but I don't, didn't see more than that. Yeah, yeah, it seemed to be something to do with the this particular church, but yeah, uh, yeah rough, you know. Oof. Horrible, horrible. Two more quick things before we get to the interview. So a uh, quick update on a story we covered when it broke, which is the former U.S. ambassador, a former U.S. ambassador named Manuel Rocha, was sentenced to 15 years in prison on Friday. Rocha pleaded guilty to acting as a secret agent for the Cuban government for up to 40 years. He worked in top jobs at the State Department, uh, at the White House on the national security staff in the mid-90s. He was even the U.S. ambassador to Bolivia, so a very senior guy. Rocha's indictment says he was recruited by Cuban intelligence while visiting Chile in 1973, so right after graduating from college. Day, yeah. yeah, so these Cuban intel guys, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were playing yeah, the long game, yeah, man. Yeah, were... He wasn't a citizen yeah, yet, I don't yeah. think, and he joined the State Department in 1981. So they got him early. So Rocha left the State Department in 2002. I'd watch the movie of this one. Yeah. I would watch yeah, this yeah. movie too. Uh, he later worked... Uh, as an advisor to U.S. Southern Command from, like, I think, 06 to 2012. So, again, he stayed in government, stayed focused on uh, U.S. entities that managed Cuba. Uh, he uh, also apparently stayed loyal to the Cuban government because in 2022 and 2023, the FBI did this sting operation where they sent someone undercover to contact Rocha, and he started bragging about his accomplishments and loyalty to Cuba. The Associated Press reported that a Cuban defector tipped off a former CIA officer about Rocha as far back as 2006, hmm. but it sounds like they just dropped the ball, so great job, Bush administration. Um, <laughs> it is not clear if Rocha is fully cooperating about all that he did and knows, but man, like uh, an infiltration, a double agent at that level really makes you wonder how much stuff yeah. just gets missed. Yeah, like how many more of these there are, you know? Um, the limits of counterintelligence. It, it does. A lot of smoke I, and I mirrors mean, there. Like, uh, it's, it's interesting... Um, so I'm going to nerd out here for a second because yeah. I've been doing some like research uh, for this book I'm working on that involves Martin Luther King. And it gets at um, when the intelligence community was kind of set up, J. Edgar Hoover lost out at first, right? Hoover is running the FBI. They create a CIA instead, so they create a different intelligence agency. But what Hoover got is counterintelligence, right? Like the basically loyalty investigations in the United States, security clearances, things like that. And Hoover used it to kind of create this massive power structure, mm -hmm. right? Because you and I, like, have had the experience of, like, having to meet FBI guys who ask you all these questions. And what's Mine said to me when, de when we were detailing my drug use, how do you do that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the funny thing about it is, so this, like, this, oh is, this is where the nerd this out This is the worst conversation connects. of my life. Well, the, yeah, this is where the nerd out connects to the, the Cuban thing. Because, yeah, they ask you these dumb questions like, you know, have you ever been a member of a party committed to overthrow? They, basically, they, are you communist, yes. right? Which, and then they ask you if you've ever used drugs, right? And if you're gay. And, and then they ask you about, yeah, if, if you had, had mental or if you've had treatments. sex with like foreigners and stuff. Which, guess what those questions are? They're like weird J. Edgar Hoover questions. Totally. Never it, mind. Trump's going to have a $500 million debt that someone's going to pay for him. It, it's amazing. Seems like a bigger deal. Yeah, no, it's amazing reading this book that I'm like, oh, I always thought these questions are weird, but it's all because J. Edgar Hoover That's wanted wild. to know. I didn't know that. Who was sleeping with who? Who was a communist? Like who? So there's who, just no rhyme or reason. Yeah, it's to no. It. It, the rhyme or reason was like the FBI wanted to have Hoover. files on everybody, yep. right? And and meanwhile, like if you had a real counterintelligence approach, you wouldn't get because I had the same thing. I uh, drug use. You know, well, where did you get the drugs? I'm like, right. it's fucking college, man. Like, like <laughs> wasn't a, like I remember the like they kept asking me like, well, I, I, that you know, it seems like you did a bunch of marijuana. Like, where'd you get that from? I'm like. Were you ever in a dorm, dude? Like, they, I, they it's make not a you, hard thing to get your hands on, you know? They they try to like do like a chain of custody with like exactly. every like you know 
uh, bag of weed you've ever bought. <laughs> totally, and I ended totally. up like giving them the name of like one of my really good friends from college and a bunch of FBI guys <laughs> was in his I did, office. I, I did the same and he thing. was like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> why, yeah. why me? I was like, I don't I know. I took it you... too seriously. Because I, 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 I actually answered the questions. I remember my favorite was like somebody I was talking to later was like, you, uh, I won't name who this person is because they're actually like a, like, and he's like, you told the truth on your fucking form? <laughs> like, nobody does that, you know? Like, like it was the, but like. I, I, I think the marijuana use thing, I just wrote like the infinity sign. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, God. But I mean, again, like, these there's these <laughs> massive amounts and I, I it's also like a, a again no no offense to the poor schlubs who have to go out and interview people like you and me but it made me think like something like one percent of americans have security clearances it's a fucking jobs program too because right the, like amount of time and these people are putting in these pointless investigations it took like nine months yeah and it's like we they, know they were like interviewing my mom we're not catching the actual because guess who the counterintelligence threat isn't it's not someone who smoked pot in high school no. or even someone who like subscribed to some fucking communist newspaper in college, right? right? right. It, it's the person that is like, you know, <laughs> dealing with foreign governments. Owes money or has some weird allegiance. Owes mo- yeah, or, like mm-hmm. so uh, all this is to say our entire counterintelligence structure is fucked up and it's fucked up because it's rooted in this like peculiar sociopath Jade Groover who used it to like gather information on mass amounts of Americans end of nerd out no that's really good and like weirdos like uh, James Angleton who were like specialized in counterintelligence God knows if they harmed or hurt the country a lot of people think hurt in the long run they're these weirdos too if you want to get you know like Robert Hansen remember the guy Mm -hmm. like FBI guy who's passing all this stuff to the Russians they're always like when you learn about these people, they're usually like it's not that shocking. It's so obvious. It's so obvious, right? They were making like, like yeah. ten grand a year at the time <laughs> yeah. and they had like a ninety thousand dollar Porsche and nobody noticed. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Hansen had like and he yeah. had like some girlfriend that he would impress with all this like like and so if they were less busy cracking down basically on liberals, because, you know, that who was more likely to smoke weed and, you know, engage in left wing campus politics. Like they they might actually catch the the spies, right? Apparently, Rocha, you know, sort of fooled everybody by by assuming the identity of like a super hardline anti communist guy to the point when he was uh, in the U.S. when he was a U.S. ambassador to Bolivia, he seemed to overtly come out in opposition to the leftist candidate then running for president, which surprise surprise helped that guy win. Right. Yeah, so he, yeah, yeah, he, he pretended yeah. he was That's a right winger. Yeah. Right. So like th- there was all this sort of obvious kind of subterfuge happening. Because, you well, that w- what if I mean, this is why the Cubans are smart, because they're like, oh, we could have our asset in Bolivia. The U.S. is so unpopular that this guy meddling in Bolivian affairs as an anti-communist is actually going to help the left wing guy win. You know, it's the ultimate irony of the stupidity of American foreign policy in Latin Just America. Use our yeah. nonsense against us. Uh, last thing, Ben. Did you bring your royal correspondent hat to the office today? Uh, I mean, I can put it on. Can you throw it on? Because uh, I was actually reading some Danish royal news. Oh, okay. Well, this isn't uh, Danish. Okay. I have just a question yeah. for you. I yeah. just want to know if you saw that Meghan Markle soft launched her oh, lifestyle brand. Because yeah, you flagged it for me. I think. Okay, so the first, somebody on our text chain. The did. first product she's uh, apparently releasing some sort of strawberry jam from the American Riviera Orchard brand. It was sent to 50 5 total influencers. Each one is numbered, so when you Instagram it, you can see. Did you get one? I, I didn't, but I just don't understand why hmm. she's not doing like a reboot of Suits or something. Like, what, why the jam? I don't know why jam. I, I was hoping you had some insight there. Are they big jam fans? I mean, the Brits are bidding the jam. I mean, but she's not the. I, the, the this, this, I, I don't know who's giving them advice. Yeah, know? I don't know about who's this. Who's giving one. them advice on like the. The podcast was weird. Uh, I actually listened to the podcast, and mm. it's a it was proof that like just because you're famous doesn't mean you you know this this is a hard job. People you gotta be willing to say stuff. You all think that this is easy. You know, you and I a lot of preparation goes into this. You, <laughs> you know. gotta be willing to tell embarrassing <laughs> yeah, yeah, stories yeah, yeah. about your security about your, clearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one, so I'm gonna drop my Danish royal thing because there's a great Please. Washington Post story. Did you know that the defense attaché for Denmark and Washington is like literally. Like the print, like the the son of the Queen of Denmark, or the, bro- or the brother of the current king. No, yeah. like a Danish royal, and it gets more interesting. Um, so the Queen of Denmark had two sons: the older son, who was the crown prince, and this guy. Then she announced that she was abdicating, but she also announced that she was stripping this guy's kids of their prince titles. Why? So now they're just counts and countesses. Oh, the horror. Seems kind of, and then this guy, they all like shot back. They're like, oh, we're really offended by that, which you might think they would be. 
and now he's in Washington as a defense attaché. I knew none of this. Um, so that's a sweet the, job. Just saying you're a defense attaché or any yeah, kind of attaché. Attaché. Yeah, yeah. That's got to get you open some doors. Wasn't uh, you know, an old friend of the pod, Caitlin Hayden's um, husband, Erlinger Erlingson, I think, was, uh, I think he was a defense attaché for the Icelandic embassy. I think that's right. What a cool job to be the defense attaché for, for, for Iceland. You're basically yeah. a modern Viking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy had the look, he too. He was tall. Yeah, he's tall. Tall, handsome. Yeah, tall, handsome guy. Drink of water. This is a good test if Caitlin... There's a, probably a 0% chance that Caitlin listens to this podcast, but, yeah. but we'll find out now. We'll find yeah. out now. Yeah, yeah. Well, by the way, if you didn't get one of the 50 influencer uh, bottles of jam... Uh, according to the BBC, visitors to the gift shops in any royal palace can get the Buckingham Palace Strawberry Preserve for £3.95 or the Windsor Castle Fine Cut Seville Orange Marmalade for the same price. Is that why they're doing it? Maybe they just want a direct war. This is like a war, a jam <laughs> war, you know? It's like an old school war, war the jams British yeah, yeah. By the way, you should watch Shogun if you haven't. Alona pitched it to me. I watched the first two episodes. Great. It's like 1600 Japan, the Portuguese, the Brits great job i i this is the second time i got that recommendation today um quick plug too i did uh i did the escape hatch podcast this morning with uh jason goldman oh yeah awesome dude we we watched called dune pod the, yeah yeah we, we you rewatch a movie and and uh we did uh, hunt for red october oh great one. which by the way ages quite well uh, great movie. check it out yeah but we somehow it came up shogun these guys were raving about shogun so i got that's my next one i watched ripley um have you watched ripley uh i don't think so it's like the talent of Mr. Ripley, except the TV okay. series of okay. it, and it's cool. It's okay, cool. cool. Yeah. We're going to do a quick uh, Crazy <laughs> Ivan. When we come back, you will hear my interview with Khalid al-Gindi. We're going to talk about what happens after the war in Gaza stops and how you reconstruct the Gaza Strip and how you build a political process going forward. So stick around for that. My guest today is Khalid al-Gindi. He is a senior fellow and director of program on Palestine and the Palestinian-Israeli affairs at the Middle East Institute. He's also the author of the excellent book, Blind Spot, America and the Palestinians from Balfour to Trump. Uh, great to see you. Thank you for doing the show. Yeah, thanks for having me back. So um, it has been six months of this uh, nightmare of a war in Gaza. Um, eventually, it will have to end. Uh, and, you know, as, as awful as the war has been, I think things will get even harder after. So we wanted to talk about that today. And just sort of get, you know, you've done a lot of great writing uh, about this, but I just want to get your sense of, of what will be required for reconstruction and governance going forward. It's hard to know really where to start on the question of reconstruction and governance. Um, you know, in the past, whenever there have been wars long and short, you know, the shortest was maybe a few days and then the longest was like 51 days. Right. before now. And so we've never seen anything like this in terms of the scale of destruction. Um, I know the World Bank is putting the reconstruction figure at around 18 and a half billion, uh, which is, to me, sounds very, very modest. And I, yeah. and I think it relates only to things like housing, because about 60 to 70 percent of the housing stock has been destroyed or at least enough to be unlivable. Um, so probably a, a, a safer estimate would, would be like a hundred billion for, for everything. Cause you have to rebuild hospitals and roads and sewage lines and all kinds of infrastructure that was civilian infrastructure that was just deliberately destroyed. And in the meantime, what happens, right? How does Gaza be a livable place? So it's, it's a kind of it's a question that that I don't have an answer to because you have a a, a place, a small, densely packed, uh, populated space where virtually all of the schools, um, most of the hospitals, uh, all uh, or at least five of the seven major universities have been completely destroyed. In addition to, as we said, more than you know, around two thirds of the housing stock. So. How do you live in a place that doesn't have these kind of basic services and functions in the meantime, as it's being rebuilt, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you could if you could locate those resources, how how do people live there? Um, and my fear, and I think the fear of a lot of people, is that they won't. Uh, over time, we'll see people, you know, maybe trickling out uh, at first, but then eventually 
you might see a mass exodus over the next five to 10 years because people need to educate their kids, people need work, people need hospitals. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know how you deal with the, the reconstruction part. That's on the technical side. On the political side, it's even harder because where the US and the Europeans and maybe the Arab states are with regard to Gaza's reconstruction and rehabilitation is not at all where the Israeli government is. Yeah. Um, and, and so that huge gap is going to work in the favor of the parties that are on the ground, namely the Israelis. The Israelis don't care about reconstruction. They don't care about anyone's security, but their own. And, and so they're not looking at long-term governance in the, in traditional terms. They're looking at who can we recruit now that serves our immediate interests, including so they don't even trust the humanitarian aid groups. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they're looking to to cultivate a different kind of leadership uh, that is more parochial, you know, business leaders, heads of clans, uh, maybe gangs and warlords at some point. Um, and so we have two completely different visions for for Gaza's uh, short and medium term future. And I don't know how those get reconciled. Yeah. And even just on the reconstruction point, I mean, there's a conversation <laughs> happening right now about were the Israelis to launch a ground invasion into Rafa, which we all hope they will not do, they would need to move a whole bunch of civilians into another part of the country. But th these areas are littered with unexploded ordnance. I, I mean, these these continue to be kill zones, regardless of whether they're being actively bombed. So I just I don't know how any of this works. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how any of it works either. I mean, the, the deconfliction process or what what passes for deconfliction over the past six months hasn't worked, right? I mean, we, as we saw the most recently with the World Central Kitchen uh, attack on, the, on their convoy, this was a deconflicted area. Um, the Israelis had their exact coordinates um, and yet they were still targeted uh, quite precisely, you know, three in a row, three hits in a row. Um, and and we've, we've seen this from the very beginning, you know, when Palestinians were first told to evacuate the north uh, and they were told, you know, we have to follow this route and only this route and you'll be safe. And those same routes were also being bombed. Um, so the track record of deconfliction, um, of of providing safe spaces for civilians it just isn't there. Um, and it's, I think it's clear to everyone who's paying attention that it's not, it's not because the Israelis don't have the capability. It's that it's just not a priority mm -hmm. to, to protect civilians. Um, it, you know, they're, uh, I, I've, I just, I keep hearing horror story after horror story of people who are told to escape only to find that in the exact uh, route when they follow the exact instructions, they're still in many cases being fired on. So, yeah, I just I don't know how it happens, and I don't know where you put them inside Gaza. Um, and, and I think the fear is that they will be pushed outside of Gaza into Egypt. You know, because it's you know Rafa is right there on the Egyptian border. Right. I agree. It does seem like that will be harder. I mean, you talked about. There's this huge disconnect between what the United States is talking about, which is empowering the Palestinian Authority and asking them to take the lead in Gaza. Um, the Israelis, as you mentioned, don't like that plan. They want to go a different route. But there's also reports, more importantly, in my opinion, uh, of tensions between Hamas and Fatah, uh, the sort of lead Palestinian parties. Um, and it all calls into question how to find some sort of single unified Palestinian leadership that could take the lead on giving Palestinians a voice in these processes going forward and a voice in reconstruction. Are, are you seeing any process emerge or any leaders emerge that you think might kind of be the generation or, or, or process for which these, you know, this political challenge gets sorted out? Sadly, I don't. Um, I think there are, there are huge gaps uh, across the board uh, between Israelis and the, the U.S., obviously, between Israelis and Palestinians, among Palestinians, probably within 
the two factions within Fatah, there are, there are different visions. Within Hamas, you have different factions. You know, you have a leadership that is based outside of Gaza in Doha. You have um, obviously Yahya Sinwar inside and his immediate um, circle of leadership. Uh, and you have, you know, you have uh, others um, in the diaspora, in Lebanon, for example. So um, are they on the same page? It's not, it's not clear that they are. Yeah. I think part of the problem has been the kind of zero sum thinking on all sides. Obviously, when you have massive uh, death, um, people, you know, people kind of retreat to these very absolutist um ideas and visions and and zero sum certainly that was true of the israelis uh early on and and hamas as well that's to be expected um i think what was missing um was for a responsible third party actor to emerge to say um who who, who could not think in zero sum terms and think in much more reasonable terms about what is feasible and what isn't and what's necessary. Uh, and the United States should have been that party, but but they weren't. They sort of bought into the the zero sum calculations uh, that the Israelis were were pushing out there. And that is Hamas has to be completely destroyed as a military movement and politically as a governing force. Um, that was never achievable and it was always untenable. And so I I think it was quite reckless for the United States to buy into that early on, um, even though they kind of hedged and moved away from that kind of rhetoric. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's it's too late. Um, and and so also, I think another mistake was giving the unconditional full throated support for Israel's war aims before Israel had had articulated a plan. Mm -hmm. You know, here we are six months into this, and we still don't know what the Israeli plan is. I mean, they Netanyahu has put out his ideas, but they're all non-starter ideas. Um, and they're not, it's not a real plan for Gaza. Um, it's just something that they could, you know, check the box and say, here you go, Washington, we've, we, this is our vision. Um, but I think it was a mistake to give such unconditional support without knowing what the end game was and so here we are six months in yeah. and we still don't know what everybody's end game uh you know something has to give hamas is going to have to be incorporated into the palestinian body politic in one form or another people will have to come to terms with that reality if you cannot accept that reality that is a recipe for endless war and and death and destruction so there's just things that we don't like that we have to accept in the world and and that is one of them hamas will not be eliminated and the corollary to that is well then therefore it will have to be incorporated into politics in some way within the internal palestinian body politic um and I think that's where the gap is. Yeah. I mean, look, even Channel 12 News in Israel reported that uh, Israeli military intelligence assesses that Hamas will exist as a guerrilla group, as a terrorist group after the war. So I think everyone agrees with what you're saying. Yeah, but it's more than just a guerrilla group, right? It's a political group. Well, it's an idea in resistance occupation. Yeah. Yeah. But and then they have an ideology and they have a base. So they have a constituency, right. you know, they have they have their support. And. And and so I mean it, it's a political movement before it's even a military right. or guerrilla movement. Right. So you were uh, an advisor to the Palestinian leadership. You were part of the Annapolis negotiations. Um, you have probably heard a lot of uh, empty rhetoric uh, about the Middle East peace process from Western leaders. You've seen a lot of failed efforts. I mean, I'm asking you to overgeneralize here, but I'm just wondering. You know, clearly there is this underlying political problem that is driving the conflict. Right. We need to get to a place where there is a Palestinian state that is led by Palestinians, where people uh, it, where people have a home. Um, and so that will require some sort of negotiations which hopefully will lead to a two-state solution. In the past, in broad strokes, what do you think the process got wrong? And are there things you think the U.S. could do to help 
fix it going forward or anyone could do? There was a lot that that the U.S. got wrong. <clears throat> That's really kind of, the, the as you know, the, the thrust of my book, which is trying to answer the question of why wasn't the U.S. able to be an effective mediator in this case, whereas in other contexts it could, you know, in the Balkans or Northern Ireland. Or, mm -hmm. um, and it has a lot to do with the fact that the, you know, the special relationship with Israel, um, the fact that the U.S. looks, U.S. Uh, officials, lawmakers, elected officials, um, administrations of both parties tend to look at the issue through a very Israel-centric lens. Um, and if you, when you do that, certain things get filtered out. Um, things like the negative consequences of Israel's power, you know, look at look at what's happening now another thing that gets filtered out is palestinian politics um it's it was i can remember um dealing with american officials you know well before october 7th and i'm always surprised at how little attention they pay to internal palestinian politics hmm. um and you know like all groups they have politics and it's not just about um, you know, who the prime minister is going to be. It is fundamentally about, you know, these different factions that have different visions for wanting to lead the Palestinian national movement. And so between those two blind spots, you know, the inability to see Israel's power and, and the asymmetry in power and how that is a driver of the conflict and therefore the key to resolving the conflict. And then secondarily, the inability to see the internal domestic Palestinian political needs, um, that there needs to be a unified Palestinian leadership. Um, that was not a priority for US officials. I mean, in fact, during the Bush administration, when that split first happened between Hamas and Fatah, you know, Palestinians were like, holy crap, this is, you know, the, our national movement has been fractured. Mm -hmm. The Bush administration saw it as a good thing. They said, this is an opportunity. Now we can move forward with the guy, the good Palestinians and sidelining and even um, pressuring and even making war on the bad Palestinians. That just doesn't make sense, you know, to, to deal with two different sets of Palestinians as though, and then pretend that one was outside the peace process, right? Hamas, mm -hmm. when in fact they could clearly torpedo the process whenever they wanted right. and and they did so yeah, quite yeah. often the biden administration today seems primarily focused on securing a normalization agreement between israel and saudi arabia as part of i guess a broader regional peace effort there's a bunch of reports on this some suggest that the u.s would have to give saudi arabia a security guarantee there's others that suggest that we would give them a nuclear energy infrastructure for some reason um, and the Israelis, I think, you know, would be asked to take meaningful steps towards the creation of a Palestinian state. I don't know exactly what that would entail. Hopefully it would be meaningful. But um, I think probably the price there went up since October 7th. Um, I don't know. I hear about all this effort being expended on this normalization agreement. And I wonder if it's the right path. It seems like a bit of a bank shot to me to get to a Palestinian state. But what do you what do you make of those efforts? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, 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 you know, bank shots an interesting way to put it. I, I, I think it it kind of underscores the extent to which the Palestinian issue is not a priority. It is a priority now because it has forced itself onto the agenda in very dramatic ways. Um, but it wasn't a priority before October seventh. They weren't. The administration wasn't shy about that. Uh, about you know letting that be known. Um, and even now they're thinking about it not in its own on its own terms mm -hmm. and for its own sake right that the fact that um, it's it's sort of even more one step removed um so now statehood palestinian statehood isn't the goal but normalization is the goal and palestinian statehood is is one of the boxes that have to be checked in order to get to that right you know, grand bargain, right. you know, the ultimate deal of Israel Saudi normalization. And so it's secondary in in terms of, you know, resolving the Israel Palestinian piece of that, which is really about Palestinian sovereignty and self determination. Um, and so I, I just I don't think I don't think 
this administration appreciates um, kind of the core issues of the conflict, which isn't Hamas. Uh, the, the conflict didn't start on October 7th. Um, terrorism is not the root cause of this conflict. The root cause is the denial of millions of Palestinians the most basic rights that other humans are entitled to, the right to live free in your own land, the right to not be dispossessed, the right to not be, uh, you know, have uh, the soldiers kick down your door in the middle of the night and take people uh, away and held without charge. I mean, not losing their land. I mean, these it's about basic rights. And as long as Palestinians don't have freedom and their basic rights, there will be a conflict. The administration, the administration is not understanding those root causes and is treating not just the symptoms, but it's treating the symptoms in an indirect way mm -hmm. by, by, by trying to um, package it under the umbrella of, uh, of Saudi Israel normalization. And so it's not even the goal Right. The goal isn't a Palestinian state or two state solution. The goal is Saudi Israel normalization. But on the way, well, we're going to have to do something on the Palestinians. Right. I mean, the other thing you you often hear kind of whispered in Washington policy circles and not to sound too cynical here, but <clears throat> people will say, well, actually, you know, Israel's neighbors, other countries in the Gulf, like the Saudis, like Egypt, like the UAE, they publicly criticize Israel when they go after Hamas, but they quietly like it because they worry about the organization as well. Maybe it's a threat to some of the autocrats in the region. Is that fair? Is that accurate? Or is that just a thing people in Washington believe? I think it's, you know, it's true to an extent, but not true to the extent that folks in Washington want it to be true. Um, and so it's a little of both. I, mm -hmm. I, and I think it be, it's less true every day, mm -hmm. the longer this goes on. Um, I can't imagine that the uh, Egyptian regime is thrilled about having a million people who are starved, uh, bombarded, desperate uh, on its borders. I, I don't see how, you know, Egyptian security and intelligence uh, establishment would think this is a good thing. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yes, everyone has a distaste for Hamas, but there are limits to to that distaste. Um, and, and especially if it involves, you know, 15,000 uh, children being killed in Gaza being annihilated. And so I, I think that particular point is, is probably overstated. And it also overlooks, you know, the reason that, you know, I, I, I don't think, um, I don't think uh, the regimes in um, Saudi or Egypt uh, or other places in the region care all that much about Palestinian civilians. But I do think that the publics in the, in these Arab countries care a lot. Um, and that's something that these regimes pay attention to. Right. Uh, and and that is, that's what at least allows them to say rhetorically, at least that they're um, that, you know, that they support the Palestinians and they're critical of Israel. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but, but I, I do think that, um, Arab, uh, ordinary Arab citizens uh, across the region have a deep and abiding um, commitment and passion and concern for the Palestinian issue. Uh, and it's just that most of the regimes are, are authoritarian and they don't particularly care about public opinion. Right. <clears throat> you have to imagine the, the sort of so-called Arab street, the, the concern about the Palestinian issue has to have increased since October 7th, given just the horrific images that we've all seen. Um, oh, yeah. The, 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 the Trump era, I mean, back to these normalization agreements, the Trump era Abraham Accord agreements where Israel signed uh, normalization deals with Bahrain, Morocco, the UAE, Sudan, those were often shorthanded in Western press as Middle East peace agreements. But the, again, the Palestinians were just an afterthought in those conversations. Usually, you know, in the case of the UAE, the U.S. basically uh, made it a huge arms sales deal to get the two sides to normalize. Right. What do you think the impact of those normalization deals was on the Middle East peace process that we all think about, which was efforts to create a Palestinian state? Yeah, 
I mean, I actually think they were at working at cross purposes, and and I know that view is not popular in, in Washington, um, but you know it's not uncommon for folks in D.C. to try to shove the square peg in the round hole whenever they can, um, and and I I do think that pursuing normalization and and I would I would dispute the you know, even calling them peace treaties as you said. Uh, these were countries that were not at war with Israel right. for them to to make peace as such. Unlike Egypt and Jordan, you know, their peace treaties with Israel, these were two countries that were uh, historically at war with Israel. But the UAE, Morocco, I mean, these are completely different animals in terms of uh, the nature of those agreements. Um, so <clears throat> I, I do think that they were designed to kind of circumvent the Palestinian issue altogether. Netanyahu said it in so many words when, uh, you know, when the Abraham Accords were, were being signed. Uh, and, and we knew that that was also a priority for the Trump administration. So if, you know, if the people who are conceiving it uh, are telling you that this is a way to bypass the Palestinian issue, um, then, then we should, you know, we should take them at their word, and mm -hmm. and I do think that it undermined the goal of a Palestinian state because it reduced one of the last remaining incentives that Israel had to end its occupation, uh, which is, you know, that being accepted and normalized in the region. So if all the Arab states normalize with Israel, well, then what we have is is pretty much a permanent Israeli occupation, also known as. Uh, uh, apartheid. So uh, if you just take something to its logical end, that will tell you uh, the impact that it has. And and it's I think it's clear to everyone that the Abraham, the Saudi Israel normalization deal in particular would be would would mean, I think, the death knell of uh, of the two state solution if it's not already dead. You have also written uh, a lot about the need for accountability. One idea to create, you know, a process to get to some accountability for not just this war, but other, but also past conflicts, is the idea of setting up some sort of truth and reconciliation commission. Um, I I think that's a smart idea. I also wonder, though, I mean, we're seeing this war empower more extreme voices on both sides in Israel. It's people like Itamar Ben Gavir, it's Smotrich, the finance minister. Uh, and of course, you know, Hamas, I think, probably has increased its reputation in the region or at least shown itself to be an, uh, an, an actor, uh, whereas the Palestinian Authority is seen as kind of complacent and corrupt. Um, what do you think it would take to get to that kind of process? Is this like pressure from the outside, the UN, the US, others? Or is this like, you know, do you need like a Mandela like figure to emerge from, you know, within Israel or, or Gaza? I do. Th I think it's a little of both. I, I, I think there needs to be from the outside, there needs to be and even from the inside, um, it, there needs to be some kind of like a reconceptualizing of this of this conflict and how you go about resolving it. Like the old way of doing it, the Oslo way um, is just is not going to work anymore. So we, you need radically different approaches, even if we're still talking about a two state solution, which in my view is probably not achievable anymore. But I understand that's where the consensus of the international community is. And so if that is their priority, then they have to do things differently. So, you know, just going back to the way things were is not going to work. Um, and so ideas like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission need to be pushed from the outside as part of a reconfigured peace process, one that centers rights and security for all sides. Um, the way the peace process functioned was because it was a U.S. mediated process and the U.S.-Israel relationship was so close, it naturally favored Israeli needs, demands, narratives, and so forth, uh, to the exclusion of those same things for Palestinians. Uh, and so you need a different approach that is much more balanced, um, that takes into account the needs of both sides uh, and pushing new ideas like truth and reconciliation, like mutual accountability. And one of the reasons the Oslo process has been such a failure 
is that it never had any um, accountability mechanisms in place at all. There mm -hmm. wasn't even kind of a verification process. Did each side meet their obligations by the deadline? And if not, what are the consequences? They studiously avoided that. So you need you need that from the outside pushing in, but you also need to have credible leaders and leaders who are willing to 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 make bold moves and to reimagine their own future. Um, and and we don't have that on either the Palestinian or the Israeli side. I tend to put the onus on the Palestinians in the sense that as the weakest party, they have the greatest stake and the most to lose in the absence of a resolution. And so it is incumbent on them, first and foremost, to have to kind of put their national movement back together and to establish a cohesive, unitary leadership of some kind, whether it's through reconciliation of Hamas and Fatah, or just that does away with them altogether and establishes some new leadership. Um, that has to be a priority to have a credible Palestinian leader uh, leadership with a vision um, and that can present itself to the international community and that can be taken seriously um, as the focal point of Palestinian agency. Now, you also need to have a leadership on the Israeli side that is willing to make these kinds of concessions, mm -hmm. right? If if the leadership is focused only on maintaining the status quo forever, regardless of the cost, uh, then you know that's not going to work. And again, that's where the international community can come in to incentivize the emergence of a new Palestinian leadership, to incentivize an Israeli leadership to. Uh, you know, to reassess its cost benefit analysis of the status quo. If the status quo, if the U.S. is always deferring or deflecting the cost of the status quo for Israel, then Israel has no incentive ever to change the status quo. So the status quo has to become costly for Israel in one form or another, politically, diplomatically, economically. You know, that's the logic of the of the BDS movement. Mm -hmm. um, nothing will change until Israel's calculations change. Um, and, and I think there are, you know, there's a role for, uh, for both uh, inside Israeli-Palestinian leaders and for outside actors uh, to push inward. Yeah. And like it, people should just know that the status quo is enormously costly for the Palestinians just in a right. number of ways, but primarily in terms of settlement construction in this sort of de facto slow motion annexation of the West Bank that is getting to the point of making it nearly impossible for there to be a Palestinian state, or at least one that is contiguous where you can drive from point A to point B uh, in, in something resembling a straight line. So you're, you know, to your point, there's been a, one side has a cost, the other side does not for the status quo. Yeah, exactly. And and we've now, and the costs are increasing. So it's no longer just that the, the land is being gobbled up that would have been you know, for a future Palestinian state, it's whole communities now that are being threatened. Um, there, so it's existential. There, there are communities in Area C of the West Bank. You know, the part that is sixty percent of the West Bank that Israel still controls, when where all the settlements are. There are a number of communities that are threatened with complete removal. But we've already seen about two thousand or so Palestinians. Um, removed from their uh, from their villages uh, in 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 the West Bank over the last year. Uh, and you have neighborhoods in Jerusalem that are faced with, you know, demolition or takeover by settlers. And 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 those threats are increasing and there is no force acting on them right now. And and that is one of the reasons why I think things exploded on October 7th. Uh, because you just have this, this, this. It's it's not just a bad status quo. It's a status quo that is bad, and it's getting worse every day. Yeah, President Biden has put in place you know the, an executive order to try to deal with some of the more extremist settlers. But I, I'm with you. I think they need to ratchet up the pressure. Seven. Right. They need it's to ratchet up the pressure. Total of seven individuals. Right. <laughs> with time to go after the the leadership, the Itmar Ben Gabirs of the world. Um. Final question for you. Look, I I. I 
it's just, it, I share your skepticism about the prospects of a two-state solution going forward. I think you're right that the, the worst outcome from a, a, an event as horrible as October 7th and this war is the same people in Washington meeting with the same Palestinian officials and the same Israeli negotiators and everything going nowhere for another decade, right? I mean, the, the hopeful piece of this is uh, Abbas won't be in charge forever. Netanyahu will hopefully be gone. Maybe he'll be in jail. I don't know that we'll love who comes after, but he, I think, is a particularly venal, uh, awful figure in Israeli history. I personally have been enormously frustrated with the way the Biden administration has approached this war because of the reasons you discussed. Like I thought hugging someone like Bibi Netanyahu, who we should not trust in, in any event, but especially in this context where he's clinging to power through the management of the war and trying to evade prosecution. Um, so I, I'm with you on like the frustration to this point. I guess if you were you know, the national security advisor and you could kind of snap your fingers and make some calls over the next six months, what do you think you'd like to see President Biden do going forward to to get us to a better place, you know, not just in the short term, but long term? You mean beyond an immediate ceasefire? Yeah. I mean, I think demanding a, a immediate ceasefire is like table stakes, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the that's the first step. Um, I mean. I would I would like to see a recognition uh, of the damage that was done um, and some accountability. Uh, you know, the, the notion that the administration could certify that Israel was in perfect compliance with international humanitarian law, uh, despite what we're seeing with our own eyes, and despite what happened just a few days ago with the World Central Kitchen and with uh, Al Shifa Hospital and the horror stories coming out of Gaza on a regular basis. Um, you know, there would need to be some kind of accountability. Uh, I would like to see uh, a halt on, on weapons transfers. Uh, until, you know, certain actions were taken, whether it's on the humanitarian front, um, uh, you know, allowing humanitarian aid to, to reach Gaza, but also Gaza's reconstruction. Uh, and, uh, you know, a much more concerted effort to encourage a Palestinian leadership that is unitary and cohesive, um, a kind of real politic acknowledgement that that Hamas will be a force in Palestinian politics, uh, and and therefore there need to be smart ways of trying to neutralize its negative influences, rather than just you know the hammer, um, because that's how we get you know to where we are. So I'd like to see a lot more nuance in the approach to internal Palestinian politics, um, a lot more accountability with regard to Israeli actions. And from there, I think the U.S. can start to rebuild its credibility that it has very, you know, uh, it's that, that it's completely dismantled um, over the last six months. I, I don't think there's any Palestinian leadership at any point in the future that will look at the United States uh, in the same way as, as someone who can play an effective or positive role. Yeah, to build that credibility to even be seen as a an honest broker in this process, to the extent we ever were. I mean, if we're being honest, right? Yeah, I mean, we we were we weren't necessarily honest brokers, but we were at least had the potential to be an effective broker. Um, but you know, I I would go back to maybe the the Clinton administration. Maybe was the last moment in which it was possible. Um, uh, for for the U.S. to play that role. By the time even Obama came in, I think things on the ground had just deteriorated so much and um, that it just wasn't achievable. So, you know, theoretically, the U.S. could play a much more constructive role without abandoning uh, its commitment to, to Israel's security. Uh, it's just they haven't yeah, haven't wanted to. They just haven't. Yeah, yeah. Just, have, just have to normalize the relationship, a carrot and a stick approach. Um, yeah. Uh, Halil Gindi, thank you so much for for joining the show. Again, the book is called Blind Spot, America and the Palestinians from Balfour to Trump. Uh, an excellent read if you want to go deep on the policy process in the past uh, and some of the failures and some hopefully ideas for how to move forward. So thank you again. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Halil Gindi for joining the show. Uh, thanks to Meghan Markle for uh, nothing. 
the not number, sending the, us any the jam. Number jam yeah um, 51 maybe coming our way thanks to those goons who like uh interviewed all of our college uh friends to this find lady, out about our drug use this lady yeah. was so yeah horrified by i felt me. bad for these people having to to spend all this time on my pretty boring mm-hmm. you know uh it was humiliating yeah sitting around you know listening to like uh jam band music uh, you know in uh, the early aughts they're like, like where did you yeah. live in, in 1996 yeah. i'm like yeah. my mom's house yeah. what how is this helping you <laughs> yeah, yeah. how is this protecting secrets what happened at the string cheese incident performance at the <laughs> new orleans jazz fest you know like, jazz fest 2000 was fucking a banger man <laughs> like like i just I was like <laughs> Uh, that's all we got this week. You made it to this. Congratulations to who made it to yeah. this. Yep. Talk to you soon. See you.